This video is sponsored in part by Squarespace. I'm Mr. Beat, and this one is for the ladies. About time. I know. You may not know this, but the title of First Lady of the United States does not automatically mean the president's wife. The First Lady of the United States, or FLOTUS, is just the title of the hostess of the White House. They live with the president and entertain guests and stuff. The current First Lady is Jill Biden, the wife of the current American president, Joe Biden. However, at least 13 women who were not wives of the president have also served as First Lady when the president was either a bachelor or a widower. At the time of the recording of this video, there has yet to be be a female American president. But what if there was? What would we call the husband? First dude? Unfortunately, no. The most frequent suggestion for the title of the husband or dude living with a female president in the White House is first gentleman of the United States. This actually is what the male spouses of female governors are usually called already. Hey, speaking of which, here are all the first gentlemen in American history at the state level. Wait, that's it? Anyway, it's worth noting that Doug Emhoff, the husband of the current vice president, Kamala Harris, has the title of second gentleman of the United States. Oh, come on. There you go, talking about dudes again in your video. This is supposed to be a video about females. I'm sorry. Since the early days of the country, the role of the First Lady has dramatically changed. In fact, the term First Lady wasn't even commonly used until at least the 1850s. While the position of First Lady has always been a ceremonial one, it's still a very, uh visible position. First ladies have a big influence on American society as trendsetters, and similar to vice presidents, over the years the position has generally become more and more important. In this video, let's briefly take a look at every single first lady in American history, and to prevent this video from turning into a three hour long video, let's just first... For now, let's just first look at their major accomplishments and legacies while living in the White House. Martha Washington, the wife of our first president, George Washington. Martha established important social and political precedents by holding weekly receptions at their residence. When political topics came up in conversation at these receptions, she was often known for changing the subject to keep everyone happy. And next up was one of Martha's good friends, Abigail Adams. Props to Abigail for vocally defending her husband, John Adams, when people were talking trash about him during his presidency. As First Lady, Abigail supervised staff, planned menus for official dinners, and managed communications that came through the president's house. Thomas Jefferson was a widower. His wife was Martha Jefferson, but she died 19 years before Thomas became president. However, Jefferson's daughter, Patsy, sometimes lived with him at the president's house as an end formal first lady to help host stuff. One of Jefferson's other daughters, Polly, also occasionally was a hostess until she died during childbirth in 1804. And now it's time for one of the most famous first ladies in American history. Dolly Madison. She had her own nickname, Lady Presidentness, after becoming known for amazing parties at the president's house. While her husband James Madison was known as a shy dude, Dolly was known as outgoing and got along with pretty much everyone. She was even able to persuade Congress to pay for improvements to the president's house. Speaking of the president's house, uh, maybe they should have waited for those improvements until after the War of 1812. As British forces marched toward it during that war, Dolly remained there until the last possible moment, gathering priceless items to save before the British burned the building down. When she later returned to Washington, D.C., people cheered her in the streets. Elizabeth Monroe the wife of James Monroe. Elizabeth was opposite of Dolly in many ways and wasn't a fan of parties and preferred a more low-key existence with her family. Part of this might have been since she was often sick. Due to her poor health, Elizabeth's daughter, Eliza Monroe Hay, often stepped in as hostess at the president's house. Her biggest accomplishment as first lady was probably saving a life. No big deal, eh? Adrian de Lafayette, the wife of Marquis de Lafayette, faced the death penalty in France until Elizabeth stepped in to secure her release. 
Louisa Adams. The wife of John Quincy Adams, Louisa is one of only two first ladies born outside the United States. She was born and raised in London, and that's where she eventually met John. During John's presidency, she suffered from depression and overall bad health. Despite that, she still managed to regularly entertain guests. While living at the president's house, she was known to regularly harvest the silk from silkworms and play her harp, which she was quite good at. Andrew Jackson was also a widower. In fact, his beloved wife, Rachel, died just days after he was first elected president, so she never officially served as first lady. That role would be filled by Rachel's niece, Emily Donaldson. She moved into the president's house at the age of 21, and her husband, Andrew Jackson Donaldson, served as President Jackson's private secretary. However, Emily and President Jackson got in a big fight during what became known as the the Petticoat Affair. Long story short, Jackson sided with the Eatons. Emily did not. This argument led to Emily no longer acting as First Lady, and toward the end of President Jackson's second term, Sarah York Jackson, who was his daughter-in-law, served as the White House hostess instead. However, some historians say it wasn't the argument over the Eatons that led to Emily no longer being First Lady, but instead her long struggle with tuberculosis, which she died of in 1836 when she was only 29. Hey, speaking of which, the next president, Martin Van Buren, also lost his wife, Hannah, to tuberculosis. She was only 35 when she died from it in 1819. 18 years later, he became the third president in American history to assume the office as a widower. However, Martin's son, Abraham, married a woman named Angelica Singleton, who was introduced to him by, wait for it, Dolly Madison. Since Van Buren had only sons, Angelica soon took over as First Lady at the President's house. At just 20 years old, Angelica is the youngest woman to ever be First Lady, and she took up the job quite well. Anna Harrison. Well, shoot. Anna's legacy was that she never even made it to Washington to officially become First Lady. Yep, she was the wife of William Henry Harrison, who was only president for a month and the first to die in office. She had stayed home back in Ohio during her husband's inauguration since she was so sick, and so Jane Irwin Harrison, William's daughter-in-law, temporarily filled in for her, but as you know, it was temporary indeed. Letitia Tyler. Despite having a stroke that left her paralyzed before her husband John became president, Letitia still managed to carry out many of her first lady duties. With the help of her daughter-in-law, Priscilla Cooper Tyler, a successful actress, after Letitia died from another stroke in 1842, Priscilla officially took over as first lady and befriended, you guessed it, Dolly Madison. Speaking of Madison, Priscilla was similar to her as someone who was outgoing and got along with just about everyone. But then, an even younger woman came for her job. Uh-oh, watch out, here comes... Julia Tyler. John Tyler became the first president to marry in office after taking his vows with Julia on June 26, 1844. Julia was 30 years younger than John. So you betcha this led to some gossip around the country. Julia was only the first lady for eight months, but she made the best of it. In the last month of her husband's presidency, she hosted a huge White House ball for around 3,000 guests. Sarah Polk the wife of James Polk. Sarah was a quite popular first lady, maybe because when James first took office, she sought the advice of, um, yeah, Dolly Madison. Dolly Madison, okay. Oh dang, is that a photograph of her? Anyway, what made Sarah really stand out is the fact that she closely advised her husband throughout his entire career. Whenever he had to make really important political decisions, he first sought her advice. She even read political documents for James. Then again, this all started because she thought he worked too much, which he did, and James asked her to help him out seriously. Margaret Taylor. 
Uh, yeah, Margaret never wanted to be first lady and literally prayed that her husband, Zachary Taylor, would lose the presidential election of 1848. But her prayers were not answered and Zachary became the 12th president, although the second one to die in office. So, hey, at least she didn't have to be first lady that long. Am I right? Too soon? Bad joke? Okay, I'm sorry about that. Anyway, Margaret cut herself off from everyone when her husband was president. So, therefore, her daughter, Mary usually filled in for first lady duties. Abigail Fillmore. The wife of Millard Fillmore, Abigail was the first first lady to ever hold a job after her marriage. She was a teacher and she rocked. And she was serious. There were no big parties at the president's house during Millard's presidency. And when she did host events, she banned smoking and drinking. Similar to Sarah Polk, Abigail often gave political advice to her husband. She tried to talk him out of signing the Fugitive Slave Act, but he didn't listen to her on that one, unfortunately. Her biggest accomplishment was getting money from Congress to start a library at the president's house. Many historians have argued that Abigail inspired many future women to pursue an education and enter various new professions. And I'd argue that her legacy is underrated. Jane Pierce. The tragic life of Jane Pierce, who was the wife of another tragic figure, Franklin Pierce. A couple months before Franklin was to be inaugurated, Jane, Franklin, and their last surviving son, Benny, were on a train between their hometown of Concord, New Hampshire, and Boston when it suddenly went off the tracks. Jane and Franklin escaped with just minor injuries, but watched in horror as the train crushed Benny to death. Jane never recovered from this tragedy and spent the first two years of Franklin's presidency in the upstairs living quarters of the president's house writing letters to her dead son. However, beginning in 1855, she once again began to slowly make public appearances and amazingly fulfilled her first lady obligations the rest of Franklin's presidency. Harriet Lane. James Buchanan was the next president, but he wasn't married, so he asked his niece, Harriet, to act as first lady. And she was a darn good one. She was an amazing event planner, for starters, and wore elaborate white dresses at parties and rooms filled with beautiful roses. During a time when the country was more divided than it ever had been, Harriet brilliantly hosted events by carefully keeping political enemies away from each other. She was was charming, diplomatic, and a trendsetter when it came to fashion. Mary Todd Lincoln, the wife of whom many historians argue was the best president ever, Abraham Lincoln. Mary did a great job keeping national morale high during the American Civil War. Even though she struggled with health issues and suffered from severe depression, she was still active as the social coordinator of the president's house, throwing big parties and regularly redecorating. She did apparently spend a lot of money doing that, by the way. Eliza Johnson, the wife of Andrew Johnson, Eliza wasn't seen in public much. Many people don't know this, but after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, the White House was looted and trashed. Well, Eliza fixed it up even nicer than it was before. Of course, she had a lot of help from her daughter, Martha, who also often took over hostess responsibilities when Eliza was sick. Julia Grant the wife of Ulysses Grant, Julia loved being first lady. She threw lavish parties that included the VIPs of the day. Her only requirements were that ladies wore hats and men left their weapons at home. She added prestige to the position and commanded dignity with every public appearance. The personal highlight during her husband's presidency was hosting the first ever big wedding at the president's house. Her daughter, Nellie, married a singer named Algernon Sartoris. When you Ulysses told her that he wouldn't be running for a third term, Julia was devastated. Lucy Hayes. Well, Lucy was only expected to live at the president's house for no more than four years, since her husband, Rutherford Hayes, promised to only serve one term as president. She hosted big parties, but made sure that alcohol was strictly prohibited. Later, her reputation as a temperance advocate earned her the nickname Lemonade Lucy. She brought lots of pets to the president's house. She famously staged the very first Easter egg hunt on the presidential lawn, and the tradition continues to this day. Lucy 
Lucy was also the first first lady to have a college degree. Lucretia Garfield. The wife of James Garfield, Lucretia wasn't that excited about becoming first lady, but she still was a fantastic hostess. She often advised her husband on political matters, especially when it came to cabinet appointments. When her husband was shot, she was actually recovering from malaria. Despite that, she still traveled quickly to be by his side. The public adored the grace she displayed as she nursed James as he tried to recover from his bullet wounds. During this time, she found out that one of the doctors who was taking care of her husband, a woman named Susan Edson, would only be paid half the amount as the male doctors also helping him. Outraged, she wrote a letter to Congress that was so persuasive that they changed their minds and decided to pay Dr. Edson the same amount as the male doctors. One of those male doctors, by the way, ended up accidentally killing James. Oops. Chester Arthur became the fourth president to enter office as a widower. His wife, Ellen, had suddenly died a year and a half before at the age of 42. So when Chester was president, his sister Mary McElroy served as his first lady. McElroy did a pretty solid job hosting activities at the president's house, even regularly inviting former first ladies to attend events. Grover Cleveland was the second president to enter office as a bachelor. But unlike James Buchanan, he got married while in office. Before that, his sister Rose acted as First Lady. Rose was unique and definitely a nonconformist, wearing what she wanted to wear and often saying what she wanted to say. Frances Cleveland. But yeah, Grover married Frances Folsom, aka Frank, who he had known since she was a child. Cleveland became the first president to actually be married at the president's house. At the age of 21, Frances became the youngest wife of a sitting president. Frances was a popular first lady who held two receptions a week, including one on Saturday afternoon in which <gasps> single women were allowed to come, as long as they had jobs. <sighs> After Grover lost re-election in 1888, Francis famously told a caretaker at the president's house, quote, I want you to take good care of all the furniture. I want to find everything just as it is now when we come back again. And come back again they did. They became the first couple to move out of the president's house, but then move right back in four years later after Grover won the election of 1892. By the way, Francis was so popular that she often appeared on campaign posters with Grover. During that second term, Francis gave birth to two children, Esther and Marion, who joined baby Ruth to make the president's house a lively place. Caroline Harrison. The wife of Benjamin Harrison, Caroline stayed busy as first lady raising money for local charities, arranging renovations to the president's house, and establishing a china collection there. She supervised the installation of electricity at the president's house, and she tried to convince Congress to expand the building, but her efforts came up short. She became the second first lady to die in office after dying from tuberculosis shortly before Benjamin lost the election and Grover came back. Benjamin's daughter, Mary, served as first lady for the last few months of his term. Ida McKinley the wife of William McKinley, Ida struggled as first lady due to epilepsy. Although this was hidden well from the public, she often was right by William's side since she regularly got seizures. And when I say hidden, I mean when she had seizures next to William at the dinner table, he would literally cover her up with a big handkerchief. Despite her poor health, Ida often traveled with William on long trips as William worried about leaving her home alone. Edith Roosevelt the wife of Theodore Roosevelt. Edith stayed pretty busy at the White House. She oversaw renovations and hired the first White House social secretary, which I didn't even know was a thing until I researched for this video. Edith held big parties and events like an elaborate wedding at the White House for her daughter, Alice, and a quote, coming out party for her daughter, Ethel. Historians generally agree that Edith was highly intelligent and had quite a bit of influence over her husband. She was the first first lady to travel abroad while in office and acted as a liaison between her husband and the British diplomat Cecil Spring Rice when negotiating a treaty to end the Russo-Japanese War. Hey, so maybe she should have gotten that Nobel Peace Prize, not Teddy. Helen Taft. First of all, look at that hat. Heck yeah. 
Anyway, the wife of William Howard Taft, Helen, nicknamed Nellie, was the first first lady to ride in the inauguration parade. In fact, she was the first to do a lot of stuff. The first first lady to publish her memoirs, to own and drive a car, to smoke cigarettes, and be vocally in support of many political issues, such as women's suffrage and workplace safety standards. Despite suffering from a stroke that impaired her speech and the right side of her body, Body, she still had a very hands-on role in the position, although her four sisters indeed helped. A big thing she did was arrange the planting of 3,020 Japanese cherry trees around DC, and those cherry trees have become iconic today. Ellen Wilson. Even though she was only in the White House for a year and a half, she had a big influence. The wife of Woodrow Wilson, she hosted two White House weddings for their daughters, Jessie and Eleanor. Ellen also presided over the first national celebration of Mother's Day in 1913. She also toured DC with congressmen to convince them that they needed to pass a law to help fix up the slums of the city. Tragically, she became the third and most recent first lady to die while in office, dying from Bright's disease on August 6, 1914. After she died, their daughter Margaret took on First Lady duties. Woodrow took the loss of Ellen hard. He became very lonely, but he did meet somebody new, someone who some historians argued was technically the first female president in American history. Edith Wilson. Woodrow married Edith on December 18th, 1915, but Edith's reign as First Lady was low-key at first due to World War I. When the war ended, Edith joined Woodrow at the Paris Peace Talks and was there when he toured the United States to rally the people to urge Congress to support the Treaty of Versailles. 8,000 miles in 22 days. It ended up costing Woodrow his health, though, and he suffered from a really bad stroke that nearly killed him on October 2nd, 1919. This left him bedridden for weeks and paralyzed on his left side for the rest of his life. Edith famously helped hide his recovery and kept things carrying on as if he was just fine. While officially she took over quote routine duties while Woodrow recovered, likely determining which staff members and officials the president would see. Again, some historians argue she she did quite a bit more than that, which is why some call her the, quote, first female president. Florence Harding. The wife of Warren Harding, Flo did well as first lady and had a big influence on national politics. Warren leaned on her for advice, for cabinet picks, and apparently she even helped him write speeches. She brought back big, elegant parties at the White House featuring thousands of guests. The press loved her, and she worked hard to protect her and her husband's image, including hiding Warren's drinking, gambling, and womanizing. She didn't hide her political views, though, from everything to women's rights to animal rights. Flo was the first first lady to have her own secret service agent. Grace Coolidge. Sure, they may have been opposites, but Grace complimented Calvin well, especially as First Lady. She was popular and famously helped raise a raccoon at the White House. The most famous party she hosted was one for the pilot Charles Lindbergh after his transatlantic flight in 1927. Lou Hoover. The wife of Herbert Hoover, Lou was highly intelligent and could speak multiple languages, including Mandarin Chinese. After the Great Depression began, she became the first first lady to make regular nationwide radio broadcasts. Eleanor Roosevelt. Possibly the most famous first lady in American history, Eleanor remains one of the most influential women in history, period. She was first lady longer than any other person. Okay, well that was because she was the wife of Franklin Roosevelt, 
who was president longer than any other person, but you know. Though Eleanor is highly respected now, she was a bit controversial when she was first lady because she spoke her mind, particularly for worker rights, women's rights, and civil rights for African Americans. She was the first first lady to hold regular press conferences, to write regular newspaper and magazine columns, and to speak at a national party convention. She traveled a lot. In her first year as first lady alone, she traveled more than 38,000 miles, providing her husband with first-hand reports on the poor conditions of folks during the Great Depression. She led many humanitarian causes, like building the homestead community of Arthurdale, West Virginia, to improve the living conditions of miners there. Since Franklin was often unable to get out in public due to his poor health, Eleanor made so many public appearances on his behalf. Simply put, Eleanor changed the role of first lady forever. In fact, she arguably overshadowed just about all future first ladies. Elizabeth Truman. The wife of Harry Truman, Elizabeth, nicknamed Bess, eh, didn't enjoy the DC scene so much and kept a much lower profile, almost completely opposite of Eleanor Roosevelt. Bess did handle White House bookkeeping and supervised the daily menu. Harry also often turned to Bess for political advice. Mamie Eisenhower. The wife of Dwight Eisenhower, Mamie oversaw the visits of more heads of state and foreign leaders than any prior first lady up to that point. Mamie valued her privacy, probably due to her struggle with Meniere's disease, an inner ear disorder that affected her ability to talk. Still, Mamie was another trendsetter, especially with fashion and her recipe for her million dollar fudge. For some reason, Mamie didn't really like the first lady who came after her. Jacqueline Kennedy. And talk about style, Jacqueline, the wife of John F. Kennedy, greatly influenced fashion as a trendsetter. Jackie's interest in the arts and culture also influenced the American public. Her biggest accomplishment was probably in how she orchestrated the restoration of the White House, hiring art experts, museum curators, and even historians to help with the process. She traveled frequently with and without her husband, despite also being being a full-time mother back home. Speaking of which, she tragically lost an infant son, Patrick, just two days after he was born. And then of course, later in 1963, she suffered another traumatic event after witnessing the assassination of her husband. She was literally right next to him when he was shot in Dallas on November 21st, 1963. Claudia Johnson. Wait, Claudia? Yeah, that was her real name. More famously known as Lady Bird. The wife of Lyndon Johnson interacted with Congress more than any previous first lady had before. She was influential in convincing her husband to push for the Head Start preschool program and was also so instrumental in getting the Highway Beautification Act passed that they all called it, quote, Lady Bird's Bill. She also started a capital beautification project, famously saying, Quote, where flowers bloom, so does hope. Lady Bird was also the first first lady to have a press secretary and chief of staff of her own. Pat Nixon. The wife of Richard Nixon, Pat was by his side for many of his campaign appearances when he ran for president. As first lady, she traveled on many big trips with Richard, including to the Soviet Union and China. In addition to hosting lots of dinner parties to VIPs, she also regularly invited ordinary folks into the White House. Her big issue she focused on as first lady was encouraging volunteer service. And of course, she coordinated the big wedding in the White House Rose Garden of her daughter Tricia to Edward Cox. Betty Ford. The wife of Gerald Ford, Betty was a very popular first lady despite her being outspoken about her political positions. She was a passionate supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment and abortion rights, for example. Betty notably raised awareness for breast cancer following her struggle with it and her mastectomy. She was remarkably candid and told things how they were. Betty was involved with lots of charities and apparently she was pretty good at hosting parties too. 
Rosalind Carter. Rosalyn is the wife of Jimmy Carter, and both are amazingly still alive. As First Lady, her big priority was promoting the performing arts. She invited classical artists from all over the world to the White House. She also prioritized increasing aid for mental health programs and programs for the elderly. Rosalyn was the first First Lady to keep her own office in the East Wing of the White House. Nancy Reagan, the wife of Ronald Reagan. Nancy was another first lady who embraced elegance, often holding extravagant events at the White House. However, she is more remembered today for her Just Say No campaign, in which she traveled around 250,000 miles and appeared all over the media in the name of fighting drug abuse. She promoted the Foster Grandparents Program to connect seniors with children. Nancy gained some negative attention too, though, mostly for her extravagant spending, but also for consulting an astrologer to assist in planning her husband's routine after he was nearly assassinated. Ronald often took Nancy's advice when it came to political matters and diplomatic decisions. Barbara Bush the wife of George H.W. Bush, Barbara was also pretty popular as First Lady. She chose literacy as her big issue to focus on to promote. She also promoted programs to help the homeless, the elderly, and those struggling with AIDS. For the most part, though, she kept a pretty low profile when it came to political stuff. Yeah, but you know who didn't keep a low profile when she was First Lady? Hillary Clinton. Soon after her husband, Bill Clinton, became president, Hillary also got to work, leading a task force to come up with a plan to make sure every American had health insurance. However, healthcare insurance companies were successful at making sure her plan failed. Hillary traveled more than any other first lady in American history and often advised Bill when it came to political decisions. However, she was also a controversial figure who was investigated multiple times for possible corrupt practices. She famously stood by her husband after it was revealed he had an extramarital affair with an intern and later lied about it under oath. Today, Hillary remains the only first lady to have a dominant political career after leaving the White House. In fact, as soon as she was done as First Lady, she became a U.S. Senator representing New York and then later became a U.S. Secretary of State. In 2016, she nearly became the first female president in American history. Laura Bush. The wife of George W. Bush, Laura remains one of the most popular first ladies in American history. Similar to her mother-in-law, former first lady Barbara Bush, Laura's big issue was literacy. In 2001, she founded the National Book Fair at the Library of Congress, now held every year. She also spoke out often about human rights abuses around the world, traveling to Africa to raise awareness for their plight against AIDS and malaria. Michelle Obama. The wife of Barack Obama, Michelle was also extremely influential as First Lady and has arguably become even more popular since leaving that position. My students used to blame her for the healthier food in the school cafeteria, though. Yeah. With her Let's Move campaign, Michelle sought to end childhood obesity by encouraging healthier foods in schools and more physical activity for children. She started a program in which DC kids planted and harvested a garden she started on the White House South Lawn. Michelle was the first African-American First Lady, oh, and the first to host a Girl Scouts camp out at the White House. Melania Trump. The wife of Donald Trump, Melania was the first First Lady not born a citizen in the United States or what would later become the United States. She grew up in what is now Slovenia. Her big issue was cyberbullying, and she started the be Best campaign that tried to get kids to be kind online. Did it work? Let me know in those comments. Many people don't realize this since she kept a fairly low profile, but Melania was an active first lady who managed many events and additional renovations to the White House. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, Jill Biden is the current first lady. Notably, she is the first first lady to ever hold an entirely separate paying job. Yep, she still teaches at Northern Virginia Community College. Most of the other 
first ladies didn't work outside the home. All of the other first ladies didn't work outside the White House. Needless to say, education has been the top priority for Jill as first lady. Despite not being elected to office, all of these first ladies have had a tremendous impact on not only the country, but the entire world. In fact, I'd argue that all ladies secretly run the world. You better believe we do. Now go upstairs and make me a sandwich. Right away. And don't forget the pickles. This video is once again sponsored in part by Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. Stand out with a beautiful website, easily engage with your audience, and sell anything. Your products, content you create, and even your time. I tried it out recently by building a website for my band, Electric Needle Room. Three things I like about Squarespace. Number one, Squarespace helps you easily collect donations with PayPal, Apple Pay, Stripe, and Venmo. Number two, Squarespace easily connects with your social media accounts. You can also automatically push website content to your social media accounts so your followers can share it too. And number three, Squarespace has powerful blogging tools to share stories, photos, videos, and updates. Categorize, share, and schedule your posts to make your content work for you. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch your website, Use code MRBEAT to save 10% off of a website or domain. So who is your favorite first lady in American history? Yeah, mine is Eleanor Roosevelt. Which of these first ladies deserves her own video? Let me know in the comments and watch out because Richard Nixon returns next week and it ain't gonna be pretty.